guys, I'm Monica and I'm an internal medicine attending and today I'm going to be talking about a super useful skill that you'll do every single day on your internal medicine rotation and that is problem listing. So I'm going to teach you a surefire step-by-step -step process on how to complete a problem list. But first let's do an overview of the five steps. So one, you want to go through the chart and list out all clinically significant and relevant abnormalities and then you want to sort acute versus chronic. Two, you want to clump problems that go together. Three, you want to designate your first problem as either the chief complaint or the most urgent problem. Four, you want to then prioritize subsequent problems by severity, urgency, and timing. And then five, you want to include an inpatient checklist. Now let's go through an admission together step by step. So this is what I personally do when I get a new admission. So let's say I'm the resident and I just got a page from the ER with a new admission. So the very first thing I do actually is to open a note. So I open an empty note, I put in my template for my admissions, and then I scroll all the way down to the assessment and plan. And that's where I start. So I open up the chart and I'm gonna look for the patient's medical history. So let's say this is Ms. Smith's medical history. And then I'm going to go ahead and start my chronic problem list. So I write chronic. And then I put her past medical history as separate problems. So she has NASH cirrhosis. NASH cirrhosis and she also has esophageal varices and that's likely due to her cirrhosis. So I'm going to put complicated by esophageal varices and just make that one problem. And then she has anemia. She has hypertension type 2 diabetes, and coronary artery disease. So great, there's my chronic problem list. So now that I have some context, I'm gonna continue my chart review. So what order do I go in? I go in the same order that I go in for pre-rounding. So I use a note template and use that as a guide to go down the different sections. So after history, what would be next? Vital signs. So I check the vital signs, and here I can see some new acute problems. So I'm gonna to go to my acute list, and in the bio signs, I see that she has a fever, so I'm gonna write that as a problem. She also has tachycardia. She has hypertension, but it's not crazy high and probably isn't that significant in this acute context, so I'm not gonna bother even making that a problem, but I am interested in the tachypnea, so I'm gonna write the tachypnea. And then look, she's satting 89% on room air, so she's hypoxic. So I'm gonna write acute hypoxic respiratory failure. So let's move on now. We don't have a physical exam yet because we haven't seen the patient yet. So let's move on to labs. Okay, so let's highlight what's abnormal here. A lot of labs are abnormal. So in this case, you want to really prioritize things that are newly abnormal because if something's been a chronic issue for years, then it's not really gonna be relevant in this acute context. So what you wanna do is scroll back in the patient's chart and look at prior lab values. So let's say these are the patient's labs from a primary care visit six months ago. So you can see here what's actually new. So the patient, again, I'm gonna go over to my problem list. So the patient has a new leukocytosis and it has neutrophilic predominance. Patient has a high procalcitonin. She has lactic acidosis. The thrombocytopenia is pretty chronic. The elevated INR is chronic. And again, these are expected because the patient has cirrhosis. And the anemia is also chronic. The creatinine, though, is not in her baseline. So what's that? That's AKI. So I'm going to write that here as a problem. And then the albumin is slightly lower than baseline, but otherwise the LFTs for this patient are stable. So I don't need to really make each of those abnormalities as a separate problem. Okay, so now we're done with the labs. We've written down all the acute abnormalities, so let's move on to look to see if we can find more problems. So after labs, what's next? So next is micro. So a lot of times the ER sent some micro, but the results are still pending, so I just put pending here. We're waiting for these to come back. I would probably just put in my note up here and under microbiology, I would put blood cultures pending, urine culture pending. That's a side note, not really part of the problem list. Okay, so after microbiology, what's next? 
imaging. So this patient got a CT face without contrast. I don't know why CT face sounds kind of funny to me, but anyways, so here we do have a new problem. She has some nasal bone fractures. So we should put that in our problem list. So non-displaced bilateral nasal bone fractures, fracture deformities. Uh, and that she also has a large left frontal scalp hematoma. Okay, so I added those to my problem list because they are significant abnormal findings on the imaging. Moving on, so we have a chest x-ray now, and let's say the chest x-ray reads not bad. But per my read, let's say, okay, so it looks like she might have a right-sided pleural effusion here, so I can add that to my problem list. Right-sided pleural effusion. So now we've pretty much gone through all the objective sections, so we need to go downstairs and get a good history from the patient and see if we can uncover any new problems there. And you're gonna do your physical exam, and again, you're gonna find new problems there. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through a full thorough history. So for this patient, son brought her in after he talked to her on the phone. The patient told him that she had fallen and hit her head. The patient herself states she woke up to find herself on the floor next to her bed. She thinks she fell off the bed somehow, but doesn't actually remember falling. One second she's sitting on her bed, and the next second she's lying on the floor face down. And she landed on the left side of her face, and she has a headache as a result of the fall. The patient states she has had a productive cough and subjective fever for three days, and she thought she just had a cold. So now we've actually uncovered a new problem, and that is a productive cough. So we're going to add that to our problem list because it's something new that we didn't expect, something new and acute. Now moving on to the physical exam. So this is her physical exam. So the pertinent positives are she, her left eye is swollen shut, not surprising because that's where she landed. And also she has decreased breath sounds over the right lower lobe, so consistent with that pleural effusion that we saw. And then in her extremity she has one plus pinning edema just in the right lower extremity. So that's significant, asymmetric swelling has its own differential. So I would add that actually as another problem. So right lower extremity swelling. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the next step. So step two is to clump problems that go together or are related to the same diagnosis. When it comes to clumping and splitting problems, there is a stylistic aspect, there are multiple right answers, but I do think that there are wrong answers. And so this is going to be one example in which you could accurately organize your problem list. So how do we decide which problems can be clumped together? So you do have to have some clinical knowledge to be able to figure this out. But let's walk through it. So two questions you want to ask yourself for every problem. Would I write the same assessment for this problem as for another problem? And is this problem an abnormality that's associated with another diagnosis that's already on my problem list? All right, so let's clump our problems together. So first we have syncope, okay, that has its own differential, that was the chief complaint, I'm just going to leave that on its own. And next we have fever, tachycardia, tachypnea. So those three things should scream SERS or sepsis to you. So SERS versus sepsis. Sepsis is the term that you use if you are pretty certain that there is an infection causing all these abnormalities. In this patient's case, she has a productive cough, she has leukocytosis, a high procalcitonin, so I'm pretty sure there is an infection going on, likely pneumonia, so I'm gonna call it sepsis. So I'm actually gonna delete these and replace them all with sepsis. Okay, moving on. So we have acute hypoxic respiratory failure, and there are other things besides pneumonia that can cause acute hypoxic respiratory failure. So I don't wanna have tunnel vision and just say this is pneumonia, so I'm gonna leave it on its own. So next we have leukocytosis. So I would actually group this with sepsis, so I'm actually gonna delete that. And then we have high procalcitonin. So high procalcitonin, for me, is more of evidence that there is likely an underlying pneumonia. I don't think I really have much to say about it on its own. So I'm actually gonna delete that and I'll probably mention it when I talk about the sepsis. Most likely secondary to pneumonia, given like, and I'll add in high procalcitonin, productive cough, blah, 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 things like that. So next is lactic acidosis. So in this case, it's pretty obvious that the lactic acidosis is related to the sepsis. If there's any question of that, you can leave it on its own because lactic acidosis does have its own differential but I'm fairly convinced that this is all related to sepsis, so I'm gonna delete that. And the way I'm gonna add it back in, really, is 
that now that I know that she has a lactic acidosis, I can say that this is actually severe sepsis. And next we have AKI. So AKI pretty much always should be its own problem, so I'm gonna leave that alone. And then next we have non-displaced, the nasal bone fractures. So I'm gonna leave that alone. I think it's a standalone thing, just like the hematoma. The right side pleural effusion. So I could say, you know, this could be part of the pneumonia picture, but this patient has cirrhosis. It could be hepatic hydrothorax, could be heart failure. It could be a lot of different things. So again, you don't wanna have tunnel vision. You don't wanna push yourself in a corner and have premature closure. So I'm gonna leave it as its own problem. Next is productive cough. So this, kind of similar to the hypercalcitonin, I'm kind of putting it together in my head as a picture of pneumonia. So I would probably not have this as a separate problem. I have no reason to think that there's a different underlying cause for this cough, but also I don't think that having a differential for this cough is really gonna be a significant piece of this clinical picture. So I'm actually gonna just take it off my problem list and I'll probably mention it when I'm talking about what I think the most likely source of the sepsis is. And then lastly, right lower extremity swelling. I think that kind of stands on its own, so I'll leave it by itself. So I hope what I'm doing is making sense and you can see how clinical reasoning kind of shapes your problem list. So now you need to figure out what problem you're gonna put at the top of your list. So in the majority of cases, it's probably gonna be the chief complaint, but if there's a slam dunk diagnosis that the ER made already, so for example, if you have a patient coming in with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and the ER already found a small bowel obstruction, you're probably not going to go into a whole differential about the abdominal pain. You have already diagnosed a small bowel obstruction, so that will be your first problem, and that is the problem that you're mainly addressing. And there are other cases in which the chief complaint might not be the first problem, and that is when severe or more urgent things arise. So for example, if you have a patient coming in with AFib and AKI with severe electrolyte abnormalities and the patient goes into cardiac arrest in the ER and gets ROS, you're not gonna put AKI and AFib as your first problem. This patient just had cardiac arrest. You're accepting this patient as the Mickey resident as post cardiac arrest management. So that should be your first problem. So for our example today, I personally would put sepsis first because it's in this situation, the most life-threatening condition. Other people might put syncope first because they're married to the idea that the first problem needs to be the chief complaint. That's fine, but this is my personal preference. Step four, prioritize your subsequent problems, taking into consideration timing, severity, and urgency. So when you're trying to put your problems in order, you need to ask yourself, how much do I care about of this problem in this moment? Or how severe is this problem? How urgent and life-threatening is this problem? You also wanna ask yourself, how much energy am I putting into this problem right now? Am I sending a workup and am I actively managing it? So that might help you figure out where it falls in your problem list. If multiple problems have equal footing in your mind, then that's fine. It can probably go in whichever order you want. And then chronic conditions usually doesn't matter what order you're going in. If you're not actively addressing them, this admission, then you can leave it in whatever order you want. So yay, we now have our problem list, but don't forget step five, which is the inpatient checklist. So I'm just gonna put the bare minimum checklist for now. So I'm gonna put DVT prophylaxis, GI prophylaxis, lines, drains, and tubes, code status, and discharge planning. So that's how you write a problem list. It seems like a long, slow process now, but as you gain clinical knowledge, you're gonna get faster and faster at this. You'll be clumping problems together automatically because your brain automatically knows what problems are associated with each other and how things come together as one diagnosis. So the more clinical experience you have, the more automatic these steps will become. Thanks for watching, guys, and if you wanna see more content on how to succeed in medical school, be sure to click that subscribe button. Bye, guys.